Good evening, everybody. My name's Greg Mackey, and I am delighted to welcome you here to the 2023 Sir Hubert Wilkins Oration. Um, it's my privilege to be the Chief Executive of the History Trust of South Australia, and through that role, uh, to play a part as um, a Chair of the Wilkins Project Committee, which is a collaboration between the SA Museum, the History Trust of South Australia, of course, and the State Library of South Australia, and the Wilkins Fan Club. I think that's probably the best way for, for me to put it. This, this man and his legacy has, has got into the heads and the hearts of so many people and yet is still a relatively speaking unknown quantity to the majority of Australians and to the majority of his fellow South Australians. I'm delighted to acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people and convey my respects. This is Kaurna land, always was, always will be. <laughs> this evening, we're here to consider Wilkins and Mawson's polar pursuits, exploring southern connections and degrees of separation. Who were these daring South Australian figures of the past? Why were they drawn to undertake supremely high-risk polar expeditions, predating specialist modern Antarctic training and preparation regimes? In this year's Sir Hubert Wilkins oration, I, for one, very much looking forward to Emma McEwen's insights. But first, a little bit more about Dr Emma McEwen, our guest orator. Emma has a BA and honours degree in English, uh, in English literature and a PhD in creative writing from the University of Adelaide. She's worked at the University of Adelaide since 2009 as a teacher and lecturer of both undergraduate and postgraduate students in English literature, creative writing, research skills and English as a second language. Emma's the author of An Antarctic Affair, uh, which was published in 2008 and The Many Lives of Douglas Mawson, uh, published in 2018. Among a string of, of journal and, and professional publications, Emma's postdoctoral research essay, Nancy Atkinson, Bacteriologist, Winemaker and Writer, 1910 to 1999, was published in the Australian Journal of Biography and History in 2018. Please welcome Dr Emma McEwen. Thank you, Greg, and um, good evening, everybody. Since its inauguration in 2018, the Wilkins orations have focused on commemorating Hubert Wilkins. Tonight, as Greg said, I'm going to do something slightly different by looking at Hubert Wilkins as well as Douglas Mawson. My aim in considering these two men together is not to put forward an argument for who might be the greater man but rather to consider what their achievements mean to a 21st century audience and why they are worth remembering. Secondly, I want to focus on their wives, Suzanne and Paquita, and the ways in which they enabled and supported their husbands' careers and influenced their reputations. Just as only certain types of men could be polar explorers in the first half of the 20th century, only certain kinds of women could marry one yet their sacrifices are largely unrecorded. As stated on their website, the key objective of the Sir Hubert Wilkins Foundation is to bring Wilkins home by ensuring that his achievements and ideas are recognised in his home state for their cultural and scientific significance. Unlike Mawson, who was born in England and grew up in Sydney, Wilkins was born and raised in South Australia Yet Mawson made his home here while Hubert Wilkins left this state as a young man. He may have returned to this country if his proposal for an Australian expedition to the Antarctic in 1939 had not been rejected by the government and if Mawson had been more supportive. 
He really remained a citizen of the world, never, never settling anywhere for long, but he made the United States his base, and it is in the United States that his collections are held in the Bird Polar Climate and Research Centre at the Ohio State University. The lack of Wilkins' archival material in South Australia partly explains why he's not better known in this country. However, over the last two decades, Wilkins has, Wilkins has come into focus. His life has inspired several films and plays, and he's been the subject of four biographies since 2000, including The Last Explorer by Simon Nasht, and more recently, Peter Fitzsimon's biography published in 2022. Several books and articles have been written by Jeff Maynard, who's arguably the main authority on Wilkins and whose exhaustive research and balanced assessment of Wilkins is to be admired. Wilkins himself wrote several books, including Under the North Pole, about his attempt to take a submarine under the ice to the pole in 1931. This book is being republished by Australiana Publications and is due to be released next month. It includes a comprehensive and insightful introduction by Carolyn Spooner from the State Library, who, as Greg said, will be joining the panel discussion later. There have been other efforts to bring the story of Wilkins to light. The formerly named Mawson Collection at the South Australian Museum is now called the Australian Polar Collection to reflect its inclusion of Wilkins as well as John Rymel, another South Australian polar pioneer. Mark Farrow looks after this collection at the museum and he will also be joining the panel discussion following this oration. The Wilkins homestead on Netfield, the property where Wilkins grew up east of Mount Bryan, 200 kilometres north of Adelaide, was restored and has been open to the public since 2001. Fittingly, it was funded with help from Dick Smith, who was not only the first to fly a helicopter to the North Pole in 1987, a feat Hubert Wilkins would most definitely have approved of, but he also pioneered Antarctic tourist flights. Incidentally, the first in a chartered Boeing 747 in 1977 carried Mawson's two daughters, my grandmother Jessica and my great aunt Pat. As Jeff Maynard notes, the Wilkins homestead and the remains of the nearby church and school building are the most significant Australian cultural sites relating to Sir Hubert because they are some of the few tangible links to him in this country. Unfortunately, Mawson's house in Adelaide was demolished in the 1960s. As I note in a chapter about his Adelaide house in my book, The Many Lives of Douglas Mawson, his hut in the Antarctic was only ever intended as a temporary shelter. Yet despite being battered by a century of ceaseless winds and neglected for 50 years, it remained standing while his family home, which was designed to last, has long since gone. While the hut in Antarctica stands as a shrine to his superhuman feats, I wonder where we can commemorate Mawson, the private man. My point is that the Wilkins cottage is important, not only because it connects Wilkins to his home state, but also because it serves as a reminder of the everyday Wilkins, of his humble beginnings alongside his extraordinary achievements, which I think helps to increase the chance of him being remembered as more than a daring adventurer. I cannot hope to cover all the feats of both men. They wore many hats. Mawson was an explorer, a scientist, an academic, an officer in the First World War, a conservationist and a farmer. He is most famous for being the sole survivor of a three-man sledging journey in Antarctica in 1912-13, on which he was forced to eat his husky dogs to survive. The expedition was called the Australasian Antarctic Expedition, and was referred to as the AAE. I will mention this expedition a few times tonight and use this acronym, AAE. Wilkins was a photographer, naturalist, climatologist, geographer, aviator, war correspondent, and polar explorer. He became an expert pilot and navigator, pioneering equipment for flying in moonlight, though he never sat for his license. He went to the Arctic and Antarctica staggering 33 times. My focus tonight is mostly on the polar achievements of both men and more specifically the scientific ambitions that underpin them. In The Last Explorer, Simon Nash argues that Wilkins always put science before glory, that while other, other explorers searched breathlessly for location, 
he, Wilkins, sought revelation. This statement is equally applicable to Douglas Mawson. Mawson and Wilkins were almost direct contemporaries. Mawson, who was born in 1882, was older by six years, but they died in the same year, 1958, just in time to see some of their predictions come true. They entered science through very different routes and viewed it from different standpoints. Mawson, who graduated with degrees in mining engineering and geology from the University of Sydney, pursued an academic career, first as a lecturer and then as professor of geology at the University of Adelaide. Wilkins took a less traditional path. He initially worked as an apprentice electrical engineer and studied electrical engineering at the Adelaide School of, of Mines, now part of UniSA, though he never graduated. At one stage, he was also enrolled at Conservatorium, Conservatorium of Music. He had ambitions of becoming a singer. Philip Ayres, author of Mawson, A Life, suggested that Mawson viewed Wilkins from the perspective of a tenured scientist's mistrust of the gifted amateur, while according to Robert Swan, Wilkins could be dismissive of conventional scientific method. Yet their ambitions were closely aligned. They were both part of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, spanning a 25-year period from 1897 to 1922, and so called because it involved traveling on foot, hauling sledges across the ice, sometimes with the help of dog teams and or ponies. Both men traversed over a thousand miles of ice on foot and were adept at survival in polar conditions. Both were also part of the beginning of the mechanical age when aeroplanes, and in the case of Wilkins, submarines, were used to explore the polar regions. While Shackleton, Scott and Amundsen were engaged in a race to reach the South Pole, Wilkins and Mawson were more interested in the scientific discoveries that could be made there. As reflective of this, Mawson turned down Scott's offer to be a member of his Pole Party on his British Antarctic expedition of 1910 to 12. Although they were not always successful, Mawson's and Wilkins' explorations of previously uncharted territory of the Antarctic and Arctic by land, air and sea, paved the way for future explorers. Mawson was the first to take a plane to the Antarctic, a Vickers monoplane, but unfortunately his plans of flying it there were ruined when the plane crashed in a demonstration flight in Adelaide. He took it to the Antarctic anyway, minus its wings, and used it as an air tractor sledge to carry supplies across the ice, for which purpose its wheels were replaced by sledge runners. It was abandoned on a sledging journey in 1912. When I went to the Antarctic in the summer of 2008 to 9, on board our ship was a team of people, a doctor, heritage carpenters and conservationists, who were going to work for six weeks at Mawson's hut site, restoring the hut and the artefacts in and around it. One of their objectives was to find the abandoned plane. They didn't succeed, but the following summer, another team found the fuselage in a few centimetres of water. In 1928, Wilkins flew across the Arctic from Alaska to Spitsbergen in a single-engined ski plane. Later that year, he became the first to explore Antarctica from the air, which led to alterations made to the map of the continent. As noted in the Encyclopaedia Britannica, although many of his observations were disproved by later expeditions, his bird's eye view influenced further exploration. A few years later, Mawson led the British, Australian, New Zealand Antarctic expedition, known as, as Banzari, which consisted of two voyages over the summers of 1929 to 30 and 1930 to 31, on which the parameters of what was to become the Australian Antarctic Territory were traversed and defined by ship and in a gypsy moth seaplane. The area covers almost six million square kilometres, some of which was territory discovered in 1911 and 14 on the AAE. Now there are four permanent Australian research stations operating in the Antarctic, one on Macquarie Island and the other three on the continent. And Australia has an international reputation for its scientific discoveries and research in the South Polar regions. While Mawson was on Banzari, Wilkins was in the north trying to navigate the US Navy's Nautilus under the Arctic Ocean to the North Pole. 
He wanted to study the ocean, take measurements of the currents, chemical changes and water temperatures, plant and sea life. He saw a submarine as more suitable for Arctic work than aeroplanes because it could stop whenever it wanted and act for the scientists on board like a floating laboratory. The voyage took place in the summer when there are enough pockets of sea which are not covered in ice, making it possible for the submarine to surface. Although the expedition failed due to mechanical trouble, Wilkins demonstrated that submarines could be taken under the polar ice cap. He would be pleased to know that today submarines are sent on missions to the North Pole to collect data on the physics, chemistry and geology of the Arctic Ocean. In 1958, just six weeks before Wilkins died, the US Navy reached the North Pole in the first nuclear submarine, which they named Nautilus after the one Wilkins had attempted to take to the pole in 1931. A second submarine, the Skate, reached the North Pole a few days later. On arrival, the captain sent Wilkins a message in which he said, the majority of your aims and predictions of nearly 30 years ago were realised this summer. A few months later, the skate became the first vessel to surface at the North Pole, where, as were his wishes, Wilkins' ashes were thrown to the wind. As Nash points out, George Wilkins' pioneering feats in aviation and moving pictures, and we could add submarines here too, were only tools in pursuit of his desire to understand the weather. He felt that few scientists were considering the weather from a global perspective. His ultimate ambition was to use the information gathered in his work in out-of-the-way places to build up a comprehensive international weather service that would adequately include the polar regions. Both he and Mawson accurately predicted that the poles held vital data about the world's climate, and they believed that if long-range weather forecasts could be obtained, it would help to prepare for extreme weather events. When he was a boy, Wilkins' family endured years of drought on their farm in South Australia. This, notes Nash, taught him both humility in the face of nature and a determination to do something about it. His later witnessing of the ravages of famine and drought in Austria, Poland, Russia and Germany following World War II which he recognised were not only a result of war, but also of unexpected seasonal changes of weather, made him even more determined. He said in Under the North Pole that he realised the need for weather forecasting for the world, specifically that an understanding of the weather and climatic conditions was necessary to prevent animals from suffering and families from becoming destitute. Jeff Maynard argues that Wilkins' curiosity about the weather and how to predict it became an, a, an obsession. He dreamt of establishing a ring of meteorological stations around Antarctica. Mawson held similar aspirations. He felt that weather forecasts could potentially prevent shipwrecks and the destruction of farmers' crops. On the AAE, he pioneered wireless communication from the Antarctic mainly so that he could send re re regular weather reports to Australia. Ironically, he and his men constantly battled against terrific winds, which frequently blew down the masts. And the first wireless message received from the Antarctic was having hell of a time waiting for calm weather. There is no trace of the wireless station he built on the continent at the site of his hut but I was fortunate enough to see the remains of the relay station at Macquarie Island on my voyage in 2008 to 9. Much of the meteorological data collected on Mawson's expeditions to the Antarctic, as well as data about sea levels, animal populations, water temperatures and ice structures, are now compared against data, modern data, to understand and assess the impact of the changing environment of the Antarctic. To mark the centenary of the AAE, in the summer of 2013 to 14, Professor Chris Turney from the University of South, New South Wales set out to replicate the science work of the expedition. He repeated the measurements taken on the AE and compared them with his own to find out how climate change in the Antarctic is influencing weather patterns in Australia. According to Turney, the data collected is vital to tracking global warming. 
Now, more than 100 years later, our focus is on how to mitigate the effects of climate change. And the impact of rising sea levels and increasing temperatures is perhaps most visible in the polar regions, where both Hubert Wilkins and Douglas Mawson undertook expeditions a century ago. It seems timely to reflect on their predictions about the global importance of these regions. I'd like now to turn to the wives of Mawson and Wilson, sorry, Wilkins, Paquita and Suzanne Evans, a Broadway actress from Victoria who went by her stage name, Suzanne Bennett. It took a certain kind of resilience to endure their husband's long absences and the constant anxiety about their safety and whereabouts. Though too late for Suzanne and Paquita, the Antarctic Wives Association was established in 1966 in recognition of the need for a supportive network for women. When the suggestion was put to Paquita, she, she apparently said, don't do it, you'll only start a wailing wall for women. <laughs> However, it was established and it's still operating today. Paquita met Mawson and became engaged to him before he left for the Antarctic in 1911 on the expedition on which he would almost die. She did not see him again until 1914. Their engagement, unexpectedly prolonged by almost a year, was conducted almost entirely through letters, most of which remained unsent at the time. These letters were found in the 1990s by the late Nancy Robinson Flannery, whose son-in-law I met this evening, when she was engaged in valuing Mawson's paper estate at the University of Adelaide. The collection's title, This Everlasting Silence, is a phrase Paquita used in a letter and it expressed her exasperation at the long periods of time without word from Mawson. In 22 of the 27 months that he was away, she received no letters and only four wireless messages. I explore the role of letter writing in the Mawson's relationship in my books and I devote a chapter to this topic in The Many Lives of Douglas Mawson. Suzanne met and married Wilkins in 1929, almost two decades later, by which time communication technology had advanced. She recalled that Wilkins' letters, cables and shortwave messages were always a comfort in their 32-year marriage, which was, as she described it, a pattern of hello, goodbye and hello again. Wilkins was seldom home for more than two months at a time. In one year, according to a newspaper report, he was away for all but 12 days, and by Suzanne's account, they spent just three months together in the first eight years of their marriage. Both Wilkins and Mawson pursued careers that required them to put their lives at risk. Suzanne admitted that she spent much of her time in a state of suspense because she was conditioned to the possibility that one day her husband might never return and because he was indifferent to the thought of death. Aside from his polar expeditions, Wilkins also went to war. Officers who worked with him were astounded at the risks he would take to get a photograph, carrying his tripod across the battlefields, which were frequently under fire. One man remarked, I sometimes wonder if George is really trying to get killed. Similarly, a colleague of Mawson said that Mawson was always impatient to get to his scientific work and he discounted all dangers in between. Both women accepted that their husbands were committed to something bigger than themselves, something bigger than their marriages. Science came first with him every time, recalled Paquita in an interview a few years after Mawson's death. His wife, his family, we all came second. Suzanne also realised that Wilkins' work was his main priority. Shortly before they married in a registry office in Ohio, he invited her to the first Cleveland National Air Races. She later recalled him talking about the races and a tractor he wanted to buy all the way to Cleveland, which made her wonder whether he'd marry a new plane, a caterpillar or me. She conceded that Wilkins had not married her for her geographical knowledge, but she found that she was able to make an impression on people when she spoke of Hubert's fathometer and that occasionally throwing in the word oceanographical was an effective bit of conversational shrapnel. Nothing and nobody could hold this man down, said Suzanne. He had a restless urge to move and act. Since I could not change this, I accepted it. 
In an address in 1937, she said, there are many drawbacks, yet there is always a fascination with the work that my husband has given his whole life to create. If in some small way I can be instrumental in helping him to achieve the ultimate goals, I shall not feel my sacrifice has been in vain. Bikita commented that once she realised that Mawson was determined to go to the Antarctic in 1911, he had no keener supporter than her. On hearing of his near-death experience on the sledging journey, she told him in a letter that she believed that he had been miraculously spared to do great things and she pledged to help him to do them. During their marriage, when they travelled together, Bikita's hand luggage consisted of glass negatives for Mawson's speaking engagements. She delivered scientific specimens to museums and scientists in Australia and Britain on his behalf. And after his death, she wrote his biography, Mawson of the Antarctic, which is a valuable resource, especially because of the details it contains about Mawson's childhood and the personal anecdotes. She wanted to expand his reputation beyond that of a man who spent his time, as she described it, crawling in and out of crevasses. This objective is in keeping with Jeff Maynard's interest in exploring the complexity of Wilkins' character, which he concedes tends to be overlooked in favour of representations of him as a fearless adventurer. Sacrifices had to be made on both sides for the marriages to work, perhaps because Mawson and Wilkins were free to pursue their careers and were frequently away from home. Both Bakita and Suzanne also enjoyed a degree of freedom. Both women had strong identities of their own, and I sometimes wonder whether the men were drawn to this about their wives and sensed, if only subconsciously, that they could survive without them if they had to. Suzanne continued acting, and Paquita, who had studied singing and the piano at the Conservatorium of Music in Adelaide, often sang at charity events. She was also involved in charities in other capacities, including serving as director of the Red Cross Civilian Relief Department through most of World War II, which was located in Gawler Place. She also had a large family, which was scattered around the world, and so she often travelled in 1939, she visited her sister Mary in Iran, where she learned to ski at the age of 50. She borrowed Mawson's Burberry trousers and the skis that he'd taken to the Antarctic in 1911. Mawson didn't approve of her skiing, learning to ski at such a late age, but he lent her the equipment all the same. The skis looked very ancient in photographs of her on the snow slopes, but she took to skiing straight away. The marriage between Wilkins and Suzanne played out in a slightly different way, perhaps accepting it as inevitable that Suzanne would get lonely seeing him so infrequently. It seems that Wilkins was resigned to his wife seeking out the company of other men. In letters to her, he often made comments such as, I expect you have any number of boyfriends to look after you over there. Although she remained married to Wilkins until his sudden death in a hotel room in 1958, Wilkins' assistant, Winston Ross, became her lover in 1939. Suzanne inherited all of Wilkins' collection of letters, documents, photographs and artefacts, which were held at his farm in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, she destroyed some material that she did not want known about him in an effort to control how he was remembered. But Wilkins is with us now and his vast collection in the US is being well looked after Scholars are continually researching and transcribing his papers so that we may know more about who he was and why he deserves to be commemorated. Simon Nash suggests that Wilkins' legacy was his sanguine, unshakable faith in our power to progress. But did he also realise our power to destroy? I do wonder what he and Mawson would say if they could see the state of the planet today, if they could see what we have done to it. Thank you. And apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for what might have been the rare mating call of the uh, St Vincent Gulf um, Antarctic penguin. <laughs> but it was not. It, uh, uh, thankfully, there are no flames. We're, we're all here and the alarm stopped. So, 
let's assume that um, we're not going to walk out after this evening's gathering uh, to an inflagration. In the History Trust, we value our relationships greatly with our sibling collecting institutions, the South Australian Museum, the State Library of South Australia, the Art Gallery of South Australia, and Art Lab Australia. Um, Carolyn Spooner, uh, who I've, I feel like I've known for decades, uh, is an engagement librarian at the State Library of South Australia. And I know Carolyn has worked there for some 40 years, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Carolyn has a special interest in the library's archival collections, which reveal the stories of South Australians, including Sir Hubert Wilkins. She's a member of the Royal Geographic Society of South Australia, the Australian Society of Sports History, and the Cricket Lovers Society. And I know Carolyn actively researches and presents on as aspects of South Australian history and has a particular interest in Wilkins. Ergo, the invitation to join us this evening. And from the South Australian Museum, Mark Farrow, who's the Senior Collections Manager, Australian Polar uh, and History of Science, has been with the South Australian Museum since 2002. He oversaw the expansion of the museum's polar focus from just the Mawson collection to include both the Wilkins and Rymel collections, as Emma mentioned. And I know that Mark describes South Australia's polar monopoly of expedition leaders. He's been actively researching uh, other museum Wilkins collections around the world and with his interest in Wilkins dating back to the attendance at the opening of the Mount Bryan East Wilkins site. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Emma McEwen, Mark Farrow and Carolyn Spooner. And let's sit back and enjoy a conversation. Start. I was just going to ask both of you um, how you came across Wilkins um, and you know what interests you about about his life. Um, I grew up in the suburb of Brighton in the 1950s and uh, Mawson was one of the prominent citizens of Brighton. So our family was very pleased that we didn't live very far from him. So I've always known about Mawson. And um, then when I started work at the State Library, Antarctica was one of our special collecting areas. And we had beautiful books on Antarctica. So I got interested in Antarctica. Then in 2015, the Wilkins Special Interest Group was formed. And an email came through to the library asking if we would send a representative to this group. And I put up my hand. I'd never heard of um, this guy called Wilkins, but he was a polar explorer. And I thought, wow, that could be interesting. So I went along to the meeting and I became inspired by him. And I put together a talk and a slideshow on him. I delved through our collections and put together a talk uh, I do lots of talks. I've got about 20 different topics, but invariably groups want me to talk about Wilkins. So I do about four talks a year on him. Mm. Um, and every time I find out more things about him because people who mm. are there at the talks have got little things to say. Have so, you got one coming up, Carolyn? One of your talks on Wilkins coming up? or? Uh, yes, I have. I'm talking in May, I think it is, to the University of the Third Age, the Flinders Group. Okay. They want me yeah. to talk about Wilkins. So mm -hmm. I'm just amazed by the level of interest that there is in him. Yes. Um, it seems as if everybody knows about him now. Yeah. That's good, isn't yeah. it? Yes. But it was a bit of a challenge um, putting together the talk because we've got so little in our archival collections. Mm. As Emma says, most mm. of the archival collections are in America and we've got one tight letter with his signature on it and a bunch of photographs from Antarctica. Mm. 
And, and it, that's, that's difficult, yeah. isn't it? Because I think, you know, you, to be able to commemorate someone, you really need to have something that you can visit or read or watch or see, you know, and if you don't have that, it makes it very difficult, doesn't yes. it? You want to get to grips with the person. Mm. Now, I compare that. Can I go on? Mm. Compare that with, um, with Mawson. Uh, we've got quite a large um, archive for Mawson, about 1.2 metres of boxes, and a couple of days ago, I went down and had a look at it and looked at some of, um, some of his letters. And there, to be able to actually hold his letters, these were runs written in 1915, written mm. to Paquita, mm. and he calls her um, my dearest heart. But then in a couple of other letters, he says, my dear punky. And in another one, he addresses her as my dear monkey. M-U-N-K-E-Y. And so just to read those kind of personal touches. And by the way, we don't know where those names yes. go <laughs> Well, I thought, what does this mean? So I went and looked at your book, An Antarctic yeah. Affair, skimmed through to see if you'd explain yeah, right. what it was, but it, there was nothing there. So I kind of felt that I was discovering something a bit new yeah. to actually see these letters Nothing, yeah. There's nothing like reading the real thing. You know, and, and like Wilkins, um, Mawson was also a great hoarder. They were both, you know, they both kept a lot of things, didn't they? So even though some things have been lost or damaged and have taken a while to surface, it is there. They Thank do goodness. have a, you know, they are very discoverable, even if they're, you know, Wilkins is a bit elusive yeah. still. Yeah. And Mark, um, how did you come across Wilkins? I think um, it was mentioned earlier at the opening in Mount Bryan East, um, mm. such an amazing place. If you ever go there, you have to actually just go beyond to Dare Hill and look across to the Mallee. Um, it's tough country and very cold. I mean, I took my son there and he almost got frostbite as I tried to drag <laughs> him up Mount Bryan itself. Um, it's a bitterly cold place, so you could almost sense, you know, an interest or an indifference to the cold that's been described to Mawson. Mm. And, yeah, I think for me, the fact that we have such different personalities, Mawson, Wymel and Wilkins, mm. they're so interesting. You couldn't concoct a more interesting and diverse group of men and their wives. So um, this, this has been a, a, a delight to hear mm. your sort of take on this, Emma and to share a bit more of, you know, these extraordinary lives. And so now the, the Polar collection has expanded to include Rymel as well as Wilkins. Yeah. How, how are you finding that and how are you going about trying at the museum to bring him to light more? Yeah, it, it, it's been interesting. It's, it's required the very generous support of the Mawson family because the Mawson Trust that really pays for a lot of my time um, had to agree that they would allow me to go beyond Mawson to include mm -hmm. Wilkins and Rymel. And every now and then we mount an expedition with the help of the Waterhouse and generate more funds. And we most recently did a, a, a Rymel trip for that actual purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that they're all carrying a bit of the, the sort of burden of history in some ways. I, I find it um, fascinating. It, it still intrigues me. It still makes me want to know more try and make those connections, try and understand what was going on. So it will keep me occupied um, for the indefinite future, I hope. Mm. And you're lucky that you've got all the artefacts as well, things they mm. actually used, which are physically really impressive to have a look at, aren't they? They are, they are special, um, and we haven't got much on display. Yeah, so how much would be, you know, what percentage is on display and what percentage is sort of in storage or elsewhere? I think the, the really special object that we have that isn't on display, but we're working on, is actually a Manlika rifle. Um, and these were very fine, almost marksman-like rifles. And you mentioned that Wilkins was a, a collector for museums. Mm -hmm. And there's a description, um, I think it's in the Cleveland Natural History Museum, of how he actually sat on the, the deck of the Nautilus submarine taking shots at birds mm -hmm. that he had to actually not only kill outright, but get them to land on the very narrow <laughs> deck of the submarines so they could be collected. Mm -hmm. And they got enough um, from him to actually share that collection with another American museum. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a beautiful object. It may be the rifle. He certainly would have had more than one of these. 
Um, and that was um, gifted to the museum by the Wilkins family. So we're mm. almost always dependent on the generosity of these families. Mm. Um, and they're always passionate, they're always interested, and mm. they're always supportive. So it makes it very easy. I think the nearest we've got to sort of an artefact uh, relating to Mawson is that we've got the first book that was ever actually printed and published in Antarctica, Aurora Australis. I think 100 copies were printed. They actually carted a whole printing press with them. And sometimes the ink looked like it was going to freeze, but they actually published this book. And there is a contribution by Mawson in it mm -hmm. as well. And I think we've got number seven of mm -hmm. Aurora Australis. So that is a fantastic it is an artefact in it, its own right. Absolutely is. Yeah, we've, we've got one of them as well. Ours is uh -huh. called Petit Poire, um, which was the name of the packing case, because they backed them all up with packing cases mm -hmm. that were these Vanesta lightweight um, wood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're, they're wonderful. I mean, the, the artefacts yeah. are special. Um, I, th I think some of them were properly uh, bound and published, and yeah. I think the other ones got the packing case treatment, so I think yours might have got the packing <laughs> case treatment. Yeah, that was produced, wasn't it, on the on Shackleton's British Antarctic expedition. Yeah. I mentioned the, the heroic age of um, Antarctic exploration and, and Shackleton more or less sort of bookended the whole period. Um, he was there very early on with um, Scott initially and then led his own expedition in 1907 to 9 and Mawson went on that expedition. That's when they produced um, Aurora Australis. And then Wilkins went with him on his last, yes. um, on which Shackleton died, didn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. And Wilkins really played a huge role in that um, Shackleton expedition. Yeah. He was sent off to South Georgia, and I think he spent six weeks there on yeah. a small island, and evidently there were about six million pairs of birds there, but he managed to find an unidentified finch which has since been called the Wilkins Bunting. Yeah. So, you know, although he was kind of self-trained, he was a really good uh, field scientist. Um, and he did yeah. some work, didn't he, in the north of Australia for um, the yeah. British Museum, yes. which produced the book Undiscovered Australia, yes. was that right? Yes. Yeah. yes, well, they engaged him to lead that expedition mm -hmm. and were thrilled with the work that he did. But I think that it's at that point he became unpopular with the Australian government because he didn't pull his punches in criticising how the white fella had treated the north of Australia, and it reflected mm. badly on the government. And I think they didn't take kindly to him for, for doing that. But That's good true. on him. He, he, he called it as it was. And interestingly, he actually um, he began collecting for the British Museum before that. So he was collecting on the Quest expedition, but he also collected in Russia when he was working for the... Society of Friends. So the British Museum have actually got some lemmings of his from Russia, which I didn't know about until I got there, and I was rather surprised to find these rather dried out specimens. Um, well, they all had a practice at that, really, then, didn't they, in those they did. days? <laughs> so did you see the lemmings in the British Museum? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what does a lemming look like? I mean, we just think of them hurling themselves off a, off a cliff. Yes. I mean, are they, are they, are they <laughs> like that, or are they big? Probably don't look like they, they usually look in life. But. No, they, they look quite small. I mean, they have, there's beautiful specimens there. There's some lovely dingoes, um, a female with cubs or pups um, that Wilkins collected, a whole range of material. I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of material out there in the UK, in the States, mm. in mm. Australia, interstate. It's and surprising. Do you, do you have a favourite artefact in the museum? For Wilkins... For Wilkins or Mawson yeah, or anywhere, any of the collections that you look after. The, um, we've mentioned this lovely book that's been published um, that was actually an unusual book because it was published before the expedition. Mm. Um, and we've mentioned also Jeff Maynard, who I hold in the highest mm. regard when it comes to all things Wilkins. Mm. So he very kindly gave the museum one of the steel-bound copies of this book that were produced to fundraise beforehand. This is under the North Pole, yeah. about him taking the submarine. And it's interesting because he also, if you read the book, he actually describes, and you can see perhaps where Mawson begins to question Wilkins, he describes a very isolated existence um, growing up mm -hmm. to an American audience 
Um, and I'm not sure I subscribe to how isolated it was, because Hallett was only a handful of miles away with a fairly decent mm. railway line. Perhaps and he thought he was safe, they'd never come here. And, and he, you know, he had, to, he had to learn how to engage the American audiences. Um, but and there's he was a lovely. Good at that, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. I can say there's a lovely newspaper um, article we dug up um, many years ago that describes him remembering how his father used to take him on the cart from Mount Bryony to Borough, and they leave at the dead of night and arrive in the morning and go promptly to the Bon Accord pub, which is sadly yeah, closed, I believe, now. Mm -hmm. And Wilkins would proudly describe to Americans in, in Pro Prohibition America how his father would sit him on the bar and give him a beer. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Wilkins was probably only a handful of years old at that time. So there's these lovely glimpses of that young sort of South Australian boy. Mm. I'm always fascinated that um, he went to the School of Mines and was studying engineering and was working at the same time with an electrical mm. engineer mm. Um, and that... Um, he loved working with machinery. He, just, he could just fix anything. I think today we would say he would almost become the machine. He just had this affinity for it as well, which is why um, uh, Monash described him as the bravest and most useful man in the, in the AIF. Yeah. And I think he wanted to go to the um, School of Mines to get additional knowledge, but I think when he had that knowledge, he said, well, I've got what I need. I don't need the bit of paper that says that I've got a degree. Um, so he probably goes down as not being sort of academic, but I think the bit of paper just wasn't that important to him. Yeah, yeah it was just one of those people who applies what he learns and his life experience. Yeah, and... yeah quite unconventional, I think. Um, because mm. we wanted to talk about a few things, didn't we? We were gonna try and divvy this up. We... <laughs> That's true. Um... I've got one more story to tell. You tell I know. yours. And, and I have one, because um, I am interested, and I'm, I know the audience is interested, because they always ask me, you know, about this rivalry. Um, and we sort of agreed that Emma wouldn't go in there. I did touch on it. You did touch on it very nicely. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting book. Um, it's called My Dear PM, and it's basically the letters, the confidential private letters that... Um, later Lord Casey, sent to Bruce, the Prime Minister of Australia in the 1920s. And I've just got a few references here that I think give you a sense of something of Wilkins and Mawson, because Casey met them both in London and he knew them quite well. And for instance, letter 137, and they've been published on the 14th of June, 1928, says, um, <clears throat> it looks like Wilkins um, will not be able to raise any money worth talking about in Australia for his expedition. This is apparently due to the activities of Sir Douglas Mawson, who never loses an opportunity to decry Wilkins. It seems a clear case of professional jealousy, and I've heard nobody suggest, brackets, not even Mawson himself, who has spoken to me on the subject, that he has anything against Wilkins except the fact that the latter has not got a university degree. And in, and in letter 189, on the 11th of April, 1929, um, Casey goes on to say, I like Mawson much better on further acquaintance, but he unfortunately has not the gift of clearness of thought or expression, which a scientific training usually engenders. That really surprised me. And like most of us, he thinks he is a heaven sent businessman, which I'm beginning to think is as common a delusion as the widespread conviction that one has a unique sense of humor. Um, but just interesting observations. I'll, I'll only read a couple more quickly out. Um, on the 9th of May, 1929, Mawson still leaves no stone unturned to, um, de de um, to cry Wilkins in the most unpleasant and childish way. He started it with me until I told him that, whatever his deficiencies, Wilkins was a friend of mine, and that as regards his work, it appeared to me that he deserved great consideration in view of his Arctic flight and his Graham land effort, leaving out his previous record. Lastly, on the 20th of June, Letter 203, I note the letter you sent from Dow, this is from Bruce's sent in New York with regard to Wilkins. This does not give me much pause. Dow, and this uh, Dow was apparently David Dow, official secretary to the Australian Commissioner in the United States, um, 
Dow knows only a part of the story. I have never thought Wilkins was a very thorough or inspired scientific man. But his usefulness lies in the fact that he has the initiative and courage to open up new areas and do a little rough but useful scientific work, which gives the lead to the more scientific but less hardy individuals who follow in his footsteps. And the word he finishes with, he is the tin opener. So I've never thought of Wilkins as the tin opener. Um, you can also find those records online, by the way, and we might put them up on the History Trust's website. That's been, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about um, Wilkins' interest in the paranormal, because as we know, he grew up in a re very religious family, but he was also uh, very close with the local uh, indigenous Nadjeri kids, and and he understood their um, amazing connection to the land and the sort of the world of the spirits. And he later got interested in the paranormal and l very later on in his life, he got involved with a group called the Urantia Group and they published their kind of Bible. And amazingly, the library's got a copy of the Urantia book it's more than 2,000 pages, and it was published in 1955, and um, Wilkins took it with him everywhere, even down to Antarctica. So to us, it looks like mumbo-jumbo, um, text revealed by celestial beings explaining the origins of the universe. So there's some science in there and some other weird stuff as well. But amazingly, to the credit of the library, we've got a copy of it. And I've got my own um, story of uh, Wilkins and the paranormal. And some of you might have been here, at, been at the meeting where Stephen Carthew, is Stephen here? He is, yes. Yeah, where, yeah, where Stephen was talking about um, Wilkins and his interest in telepathy and the paranormal. And he quoted from the book, now, this talk was on in winter, and I decided I didn't want to go all the way back to the hill, so I booked into a hotel. I booked into the Stamford Grand and went there and got my, went up to my room, and I was uh, room number 14 on the 11th floor. Got my key, trundled off to the lecture, which was terrific, and then Stephen is talking, and he quotes from the book, and being an academic, he quoted the page number that he was referring to. And he said, I'm reading from page number 1114. Read it out. I thought to myself, what? I reached into my bag, got out my room key, 1114. Now, now that, that, is, that is extraordinary. And to me, Wilkins, he, he was grounded and attached to the natural world. He also believed in higher beings, but I think he was sort of a child of the universe. I think he wasn't just interested in this life, it was mm. the universe, and he wanted to test himself in all these dangerous conditions and find out what he could find out about himself and the human condition. So it's just an additional dimension mm. along with everything else that, that goes along with him, which was extraordinary. It's really, um, not sort of in another dimension, but Tim Jarvis who I think we can probably claim as a, another South Australian um, contemporary polar pioneer. Um, yeah, so he he, um, he says that that's, you know, part of what drives him is wanting to find out, you know, it's a sort of search into yourself and what you can and can't endure. and Testing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk on oh, for hours. I think, that, I think we've probably, that's probably quite a nice note to end on, do you think? Or? I was going to say. Oh, sorry. Did you have something else? Just to finish with, I did want to say I, I was particularly impressed, Emma, at your delivery while we had the sound effects. Yes. Which actually, for me, I, I was thinking more about a submarine trying to submerge or something. And you were talking about the Nautilus. <laughs> I thought, gee, the History Trust have really gone to <laughs> extraordinary sort of ends to really get us in the mood. <laughs> so well done with that. Well, that's been a splendid journey.
a, and a, a, a discursion, a discourse, an entertainment, uh, and for which I know I speak for everybody, we thank you. And uh, the rare mating calls of the earlier uh, St. Vincent Gulf uh, Antarctic penguins, I'm sure they concur as well. It's just been brought to my attention, and, and of course, uh, an omission on my part earlier to acknowledge there are many of you here this evening who have had a long association with the Wilkins Foundation, and it's occurred to, it's been brought to my attention that some of you may not be aware that uh, at the end of last year, the Wilkins Foundation resolved to dissolve um, and to hand over uh, into the trust of the History Trust of South Australia, effectively the Wilkins Foundation's work, uh, fabulous website, education resources uh, to the History Trust uh, for good keeping, for safekeeping, and to our partners, the State Library of South Australia and to the South Australian Museum, aspects of the work that Dr Stephen Carthew and um, his colleagues, uh, Robin Turner, the, the chair, um, had been pursuing over recent years. It, it's truly a privilege for us, and I feel a, a great sense of, of indebtedness, but also gratitude for the trust that um, uh, uh, the Wilkins Foundation members have uh, conferred on the History Trust. And I can say, and I, I know I speak for our Chair of Trustees and, and um, trustees and, and senior management, uh, we, we take seriously and will assiduously pursue the, uh, the vision to ensure that Wilkins never again is forgotten uh, by uh, South Australians and uh, can rightly celebrate, commemorate um, his, uh, his legacy. So in that context, it is... It's been a privilege and a, and a delight, Emma, to uh, have you and Carolyn and Mark uh, play a part in sharing, uh, in a slightly different format, uh, the 2023 uh, Wilkins oration. Um, who knows what adventures lay ahead? Please join me in a very warm uh, round of, of applause for Emma McEwen, Mark Farrow and Carolyn Spooner. Thank you so much. Thank you.